Karen Ratnoff. I am a PhD student in French at Harvard University's Department of Romance, Languages, and Literatures. I am joined by John McCormick, Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago. We are here today to discuss his new book, published in 2018 by the Princeton University Press, called Reading Machiavelli, Scandalous Books, Suspect Engagements, and the Virtue of Populist Politics. Professor McCormick, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm happy to be here, and thank you so much. The name Machiavelli calls to mind uh, the less than generous image of the advisor to oligarchs and, and tyrants in the art of manipulating people. So I'm curious, how did you develop the idea for this project, uh, which rehabilitates Machiavelli as a sort of champion for the power of the people? Well, it kind of hit me in the face. I mean, when I first engaged Machiavelli's writings, uh, The Prince and The Discourses, uh, it, it seemed very obvious to me that Machiavelli had a praise for the common people or average citizens that's really unusual in the history of political thought, which overall is very suspicious of the people, even among authors who were considered to be Republicans or proto-Democrats. And so I was stunned that Machiavelli says, um, the people are this so source of honesty and goodness and good judgment, and uh, both a good principality and a good republic should avail itself of the people's uh, power in military affairs, that one should always arm and organize the people, and in political affairs, one should always enlist their, their judgment as much as possible. And so that was one side of the equation. And then there was this virulent anti aristocratic quality to Machiavelli that I'd never seen in any other uh, political thinker. You know, most political thinkers are very strict at distinguishing aristocrats from oligarchs, right? You know, there are the, there are the wise, good, prudent few who uh, govern for the, the sake of everybody else in a, in a well-meaning way, and then there are the oligarchs who are just the few who are out for themselves. And Machiavelli throws away that distinction and basically says, the few always are the few, and the few have this appetite to oppress and to dominate. And so whether you're a prince or whether you're a republic, you have to draw on the people uh, to, to increase uh, the power of the polity, and you need to suppress the oligarchs. And um, that was all seemed there in, in my first readings. And then I went to the literature and I was surprised at how muted that was, how in um, at least the most dominant schools in North America, uh, the so-called Cambridge School of Contextual Historical Orientation, they really wanted to tame this kind of populism in Machiavelli. They wanted to insist, you know, Machiavelli is for mixed government and the people have their proper place, but but the few, the aristocrats, also have a very important place. And it really, uh, I would say, muted or subdued the, the kind of the democratic quality of Machiavelli's thought. And then the other really dominant strand of interpretation in North America is the Straussian school established by Leo Strauss. And he really goes... Uh, all out to say that Machiavelli doesn't believe what he means when, he's, when he champions the people. And in fact, he's in favor of oligarchic rule, just more um, uh, a more hidden form of oligarchic rule. So I thought, wow, I think I could really uh, make the case for Machiavelli's populism against these two, these two ways of thinking about him. And hmm. I, I mean, I was convinced by this as oh, somebody who uh, has really only heard of Machiavelli used as this sort of tool to, you know, channel the uh, channel the people for the good of the prince. Um, and I think one of the most interesting points that you make throughout the book, um, both in the first three chapters, which are your close examination of uh, Machiavelli's depiction of the people, but also um, especially in uh, your critique of Rousseau, is uh, the influence of socioeconomic inequality, but like, particularly economic inequality, which hinders the people's ability to act as a check on the power of uh, the elite. So um, my question is, how does this observation factor into Machiavelli's uh, characterization of the people? Yeah, I mean, this, um, the problem of economic inequality is, I think, for Machiavelli, th the major problem in Republican politics. And uh, he deals with it very, very carefully. Uh, Florence is a, uh, 
a context where there was a proletarian revolution, the Trumpi revolt, and so the, the ruling classes and even the middle classes of Florence are very uh, nervous about the idea of economic inequality and redressing it. Um, and similarly, in, in Rome, in the Roman Republic, um, the questions about redistributing agrarian uh, lands uh, that were acquired in empire to the common people was a very controversial question. So Machiavelli treads lightly here, but when when you look at the when you look at his writings, he basically says all republics, no matter how equitable they start off at the beginning, uh, will suffer greater and greater economic inequality. And when they do that, it becomes harder and harder for the people to control the elites through institutions. Um, and the elite, the economic elite, are able to twist and turn and divert those institutions more and more toward their own interest and, and basically uh, make your, your normal public institutions uh, impervious to, to um, the people's attempt to direct the oligarchs. And so one of the unsettling uh, or most unsettling parts of Machiavelli's writings for me is that he, he basically says when you get too much inequality in a republic, you need to have a principality. You need to have a kind of a pro-popular um, pro tyrant because the, you, you can't redistribute through republican means to get back to the situation that makes republics possible. And so you need figures who can uh, crush the nobility single-handedly and hopefully Machiavelli implies if they don't disarm the people, you could then re reinstitute a republic after the fact. But, um, you know, Machiavelli would have been very surprised by our post-war world where there was some uh, redistribution through non-authoritarian uh, means in Europe and North America. He would have thought that always occurs. You know, he looks at examples in Sparta, uh, Agis and Cleomenes. Uh, he looks at examples in Syracuse and other Greek uh, city-states where inequality has gone too far and it really takes a unilateral, tyrannical actor to kind of reboot the republic in, in a certain way. So he would have been very surprised. Um, but, um, but I think uh, we have to be honest about his, his views that uh, tyranny is a way to address economic inequality. Yes, and he certainly doesn't seem afraid of um, kind of calling for violent class conflicts, that he kind of says, well, the people are right to lash out at the elites who are oppressing them. And then um, you showed several case studies where they're still pretty generous with the people that they've deposed right. um, in trying to redistribute kind of equi equitable power in the um, Roman uh, tribunes, et cetera. Absolutely. I mean, I think um, that's one of the, one of his objectives is to show that um, this phobia, this oclophobia, as I call it, this fear of the mob, this kind of irrational fear of the mob really uh, should be, uh, the, the elites and writers should really pull back on that. It's not as bad as you think. As he says uh, about street demonstrations and riots, he says, such things are only terrible to those who have read about them in books. In other words, if you really experience them, they're not, they're not so terrible or, or terrifying. And, um, you know, his example, I think his recounting of this proletarian revolution in Florence, the Trumpi Revolt, where these wool workers who were politically disenfranchised from the republic basically wanted a share in the, the republican polity. Um, you know, they riot, they burn down buildings, they, um, they burn records, um, they take vengeance on uh, police officials who have treated them inequitably. But in the end, this great number of Florentine able-bodied free citizens just asks for um, uh, some number of votes in the chief, the chief magistracy of the city. And even though they're the majority, they're now the new majority of citizens, they ask for a minority of votes. They're just saying, we, want, we just want a number of votes even if we'll be outvoted in this number of votes. So it's really, um, it's not something to be terribly afraid of if you really look at what people ask for after they resort to riots or demonstrations. So in the second half of your book, you take on three of the major schools of Machiavellian thought, um, Rousseau and Leo Strauss and the Cambridge School, as you, I think, said earlier. Um, but 
I found that a common thread of your challenge to these readings is that they, in fact, avoid looking at this surface level, democratic, um, pro-populist uh, aspect of Machiavelli's writings. And I'm curious as to why you think that is. Yeah, that's a good question. I know that you're being polite. Another way of saying it is, why would I think I'm right where such <laughs> magnificent minds, you know, uh, got it wrong? And, and I think that's a, a fair question. I think that um, with with Machiavelli, because of this prejudice I've, I've spoken about, I think most uh, political philosophy has a prejudice against the people that um, that there's an impulse in reading Machiavelli to resist or deflect or divert away from the, this very straightforward um, claims that he makes on behalf of the people. And, um, and I think we have three different examples. As I said, with the Cambridge School, they kind of squeeze him into a traditional Ciceronian mixed regime model. Strauss says he just doesn't mean what he says. And with Rousseau, it's it's much more subtle. He just says, let me reconstruct Rome the way you really should, and basically showing that Machiavelli's Rome is way too democratic and gives too much power to the poor. And so uh, Rousseau reconstructs it in a way that, you know, let's, let's have the wealthy outvote the poor. That'll be a way to kind of get the common good. And so, uh, you know, I think that in all those cases, what you have to do with Machiavelli on any issue is you have to compare his evaluative statements, his precepts, his theorems, his maxims, and you have to look at the examples he gives to, to back them up. And I think in the, in the prints and the discourses, uh, Machiavelli almost universally backs up in an affirmative way his praise of the people. And I think you have to take that into consideration, that he substantiates these claims in favor of popular empowerment. In a work like the Florentine Histories, though, on the other hand, he's constantly uh, criticizing the people, putting them down, and uh, reviling them, even. And so a lot of people say, oh, look, Machiavelli became more conservative as he got older and was writing about Florence. But if you, again, if you look at the examples and you care, compare them to the evaluations, the examples validate the people against the nobles. That, for instance, in the, the case of the Trumpy revolt that I just mentioned to you, you know, Machiavelli says the people want evil. Well, no, they don't want evil. If they're asking for a constitutional arrangement where they themselves can be outvoted in in the new the new constitution, um, similarly, Machiavelli says the you know the Florentine people, unlike the Roman people, didn't want to share offices with the no, with the nobles. Machiavelli shows three paragraphs before that that the the people opened up the offices of the Republic to the nobles uh, who had been excluded from them for a while, and then the nobles resort to force to try to take all those offices for themselves for the nobles. And so, there's a constant uh, you, you constantly have to compare uh, these eval these general evaluations with what's going on on the ground, with the details, with the facts, with the action. As I like to say to my students, you know, where the action in, in Machiavelli is where the action is. And I, I think that's, I hope that's what I've done in the book, to really do a sustained comparison of these evaluations and the action they, they pertain to underneath. Yes, and you not only address the action, so to speak, but uh, the context in which he has written. So you you are paying attention to the audience, especially in his later works where he's addressing people who are not so happy about a, a riotous a riotous populace. Um, the common people are not exactly uh, favored by the nobles. Uh, who he's talking to directly. So in turning to a question of audience, I'm going to ask you about uh, the word populism mm -hmm. because there are so many resonances with this book, which remains in the Italian context of Machiavelli's time with our current political climate. So what is the difference between populism in 2019 and the virtuous po populist politics of Machiavelli? Yeah, well, it's a good question. I would say the, the impulse behind populism is very much the same. I think when people are told they live in a republic and that we're all free and equal citizens and we all have uh, equal impact on the running of government, but then when the reality is that uh, uh, average people feel completely shut out and alienated and circumvented uh, and even uh, abused 
by the political system, you get a, a sense of resentment and outrage. And uh, Machiavelli wanted to channel that in institutional means. He wanted to constantly think of new ways to channel that on behalf of liberty in constructive ways. So for instance, he uh, advocated these institutions uh, that nobody in the history of constitutionalism likes, these tribunes of the plebs, right? That you have an institution uh, reserved exclusively for members of the lower class or that the wealthiest and most prominent citizens can hold and that they would have the power to veto uh, government policy or uh, uh, promote uh, legislation in assemblies or in referenda and to indict and try prominent citizens for political crimes. And so Machiavelli was, you know, always looking for ways to kind of channel the rage of the people into a way that uh, contains the elites or controls them. And um, I think, you know, there there are no avenues for that on offer nowadays. You just have uh, populism is really just addressed by demagogues who say, like, I will be your vehicle. I will be the vehicle to channel your anger. And, you know, it's a very different thing when you kind of hire a third party to do something on your behalf. A, they may not do it. <laughs> they may act on their own behalf. Uh, they may act on behalf of your enemies, in fact. They may wind up being the, the advocates of the people you think You've, you've set them out to oppose. Um, so that's a problem, whereas Machiavelli wants us to establish institutions where the people can uh, govern themselves uh, ever further. You know, and when those modes of governing themselves are circumvented or corrupted by the elites, we make new ones. And we're constantly giving... So populism should be a way, a calling for institutions where the people decide for themselves rather than um, offering parties or politicians who speak on behalf of the people. Because I think that in, in the end, that only makes people more angry because when, when leaders don't deliver on their promises, uh, it, it, it makes people lose even more faith in the republic or in their system. So I, I think that's the real difference between Machiavellian populism and what seems to be offered uh, by populism today. The other thing is the leverage that, you know, Machiavelli was never so insistent as when he, he said, you know, the people have to be armed, that there were good domestic outcomes from militarily arming the people. As he says, you know, once the Roman elite armed the people, they could not do with them exactly as they wanted to anymore, like once, once you've armed the people. And so the armed plebs had their war-making power uh, to withhold from the city to extract concessions. So they got tribunes of the plebs by saying to the Roman nobles, you defend yourself. We're, we're walking out of the city. We're marching, you know, this military discipline we have, we're marching out of the city en masse, and you defend yourselves. Uh, you decide whether you want to be defended from enemies or you want to uh, treat us as equal citizens. You make that decision, and they called the plebeians back, and they instituted the tribunes of the plebs. I think the problem today is that this popular dissatisfaction doesn't have available um, these means of extorting or extracting concessions out of elites. I mean, we have a global elite that, um, you know, can invest its, its wealth and resources in, in many different places, and it's, it's very hard to get leverage on them to, um, to share it. Um, or the cost for corrupting a political system is so low that it's very hard to, to prevent or hold accountable or make responsive those who are using a political system that's supposed to be for everybody for their own benefit. So those are, those are two disjunctures, I would say, between Machiavellian populism and the populism we see today. So I want to ask a question that I've borrowed from your jacket cover of the book. Uh, what makes your critique Machiavellian? <laughs> well, you, you catch me by saying I'm offering a Machiavellian critique of Machiavellian scholarship. Well, of course, uh, substantively, I'd like to think that bringing to the fore this democratic 
Machiavelli is letting the real Machiavelli speak for himself and answer uh, these anti-democratic uh, interpreters of, of his. But I think maybe the, there's something of the traditional uh, connotation of, of Machiavelli in it as well. That, you know, maybe, uh, maybe my interpretation offers something muscular uh, and something maybe sometimes uh, duplicitous or, uh, or at least clever, and maybe with a little bit of the mischief uh, that I identify with, with Machiavelli's writings. Professor McCormick, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time.